Okay. <laughs> Hello, guys. Welcome to our Agui NA podcast series. Today, we're going to be doing our Valentine's Day or February special. Um, we are your hosts. My name is Adia. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I'm 16 and I go to HKIS. My name is Ali. I'm, I'm 16 as well. And I go like my pronouns are she, her, and I also go to HKIS. Um, I'm Matthew. I'm 17. I go to HKIS and my pronouns are he, him. I'm Clorinda, I'm from Harrow International, and my pronouns are she, her. Awesome, so today we're gonna be talking about monogamy and the neuroscience behind attraction. Okay, so I think when we talk about monogamy, I think there's two fundamental things to understand about the evolution behind monogamy. The traits selected for an organism by evolution don't always make the organism necessarily happy. The traits that evolve in a population are the ones that are best at getting their genes passed on to the next generation, not the ones that make the body of those genes the happiest. Whatever traits get genes into the next generation essentially wins. The the evolutionary goals of males and females in any species are opposed to each other in almost like every species. This results in something called sexual conflict, which basically occurs when two sexes have conflicting optimal fitness optimal fitness strategies concerning reproduction, particularly over the mode and frequency of mating, and potentially leading to like an evolutionary arms race of some sorts between males and females. Basically, the problem is this. Females have a fixed amount of eggs, so they want to ensure the best matches possible for those eggs. Males have theoretically unlimited sperm, so their goal is to spread it as far and wide as possible. And these two facts lead to a lot of unpleasant evolutionary traits that are good for the genes, but are bad for the bodies that house those genes. As we talk about human evolution, we need to keep in mind that what is natural for a human is not what always will make it happy happiest. So, what does this mean? Yes, monogamy by science is proved to be natural for humans, but in the case of humans, monogamy doesn't mean sexual desire that is limited to one person. Humans evolve to be what science likes to refer to as socially monogamous, meaning that we choose one partner with which we pair bond while retaining a desire for other sexual sexual partners. We want to copulate with p- other sexual partners, but at the same time feel intense jealousy and possessiveness over our bonded partners. Essentially, humans evolve to be some sort of a jealous cheaters. And um, basically, there's two main evolutionary reasons for human monogamous relationships. We evolve to be socially monogamous because human babies are basically helpless. They require two humans, or even more, dedicated just to raising them due to their high caloric needs and the fact that they need to be carried in the arms of a mother or nursed for much longer periods than any other species we know. But pair bonding evolved in humans for other reasons too. Pair bonding made by, like made by male competitions for mates like m- resulted in much violent like <laughs> resulted in a much less violent affair. And most primates exist in small groups led by males due to male like male to male conflict. And monogamous pair bonds allowed ancient humans males to like coexist peacefully. But then why do we have trouble with it? Because I'm assuming, as you know, monogamy isn't obviously working and the divorce rates are inclining by far. So at the same time as individual humans were still under evolutionary pressure to find the best mate, the one that will reproduce, like that will produce the best, most successful offspring. And when sexual candidates pair off into monogamy, the best mates can become unavailable. The way this plays out for males and females is slightly different. For females, the best thing to do is get a worse male bonded and committed, i.e. like bringing meat or other resources, and then sneak off to make sure the better male is the actual, actual father, father of her offspring. Oh my which is gosh. Just, oh my god. Oh my god. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it's practiced by not only humans. And these additional males may also provide gifts and research and resources like the primary male, further providing for the females for five for, for the female's overall survival. For men, of course, the goal is simply to sleep 
with as many of the females as possible taken or not. <laughs> so this presents a problem now for modern humans. We don't want to be cheaters. Those of us who want to make a monogamous commitment want to keep those commitments happily. Those of us who want to be non-monogamous or polyamorous want to do so in a way that causes everyone involved happiness, not pain. But our evolutionary history drives us to be cheaters, giving us a mutually incom incompatible feelings of jealousy and possessiveness in a relationship while also driving us to feel penned in by monogamy. So is there neurology behind this all? First, I must state that any controlled experiments I looked into on the neurological basis of socio-sexual behaviors in humans aren't really possible or feasible. And most studies rely on animals to provide principles that might generalize to humans. So then I looked towards the prairie voles. A recent medical examiner, Larry Young, conducted like bonding studies on a monogamous rodent, the prairie vole. Because the critters and rodents were so stubbornly loyal to their mates socially, that is sexually is another story. But prairie voles are miserable when separated from their bonded partner for very long. A stress-related chemical called, um, which, pardon my pronunciation of this, but corticotropin releasing factors, also known as like CRF, acts in males separated from their female mates. The neurochemical dopamine is motivational also in the prairie voles. It drives us to act to appease a desire, such as for food or sex, and when we do, we get a neurochemical reward, typically a burst of endogenous opioids. So our brains are organized accordingly to chemically controlled circuits. When we see an interactive person, reward circuits tell us how incredible copulation with that person would be, but oxytocin and vasopressin-related circuits tell us that we love our partner, and CRF is helping us picture how miserable we'd be without our mate, just like prairie voles. In the rational part of our brain, primarily the prefrontal cortex, weighs all these factors and situations, which I believe Adia will like to elaborate on. You are right. So what you said about how um, we feel or how we feel like trust and like love with one partner or multiple partners as we might want to, um, that is true. Love is a complex neurobiological phenomenon. It relies on trust, belief, pleasure, and reward activities within the brain through our limbic processes. So these processes critically involve oxytocin, as Clarinda said before. This is a hormone critical in social and emotional bonding, reproduction, and childbirth, as well as vasopressin, which in conjunction with oxytocin is critical to pair bond for formation and selective sociality and it also plays a major role in defensive behaviors such as mate guarding so that relates to what clarinda said about like jealousy and cheating so um that in a in addition with dopamine and serotonin which the release of these neurotransmitters allows for that giddy euphoric association you would have with your partner so this in release with in sorry this, in addition to those opioids that Clarinda was talking about, um, these um, these things all cause this like dilating of blood vessels, raising blood supply, and then also lowering blood pressure. These are all things that are associated with um, that feeling of love that people experience, or like you know the experience of fe feeling chills down your spine. All of these, all of these um, emotions and feelings are just a result of, of all of these hormones and neurotransmitters being released in your body. So naturally rewarding our pleasurable activities are also necessary for survival and um, mood and motivation to like reproduce. Um, and they govern beneficial biological behaviors like eating, sex, and reproduction. So I don't know if you, you guys have, must have heard of like pheromones and how you're attracted to other people because of pheromones right so yeah. pheromones are it's usually reserved for chemical signals that are produced and received by members of the same species um in which both the sender and receiver signal gain benefit so essentially it's like it's these like two obviously we're not sending like one pheromone to like one person <laughs> it's like you're releasing those pheromones and whoever's receiving it um both both players like kind of <laughs> can tell that there is benefit to be gained here. Um, like, like it's you're believed radiating that mammals, the pheromones. 
I'm sorry. Targeting one just targeting one person. It's just with like the radiating off of you. <laughs> it's radiating off of you guys. I mean, you might not be desperate, but your pheromones definitely are. <laughs> so. Oh wow. Okay. <laughs> it's believed that I'm mammals. Assuming my pheromones are desperate. <laughs> I'm not calling you guys desperate. I'm just saying that biologically, biologically, you kind of are. <laughs> we have, apparently, it's rumored that we have this organ in our nose called the VNO or the Jacobson organ. And it's supposed to detect pheromones. So it's connected to the hypothalamus in the brain. And we, I couldn't find any particular like research on humans, but in rats, the detection of pheromones release the GNHR uh, molecule, which causes the pituitary gland in the brain to make and secrete hormones, um, the hormones LH and FSH. And both of these are reproduction hormones in females. So we don't exactly know how pheromones are connected with love, but we do know that pheromones release those reproductive um, hormones in females. So that can tie into the whole thing where... Love is just a construct to fool us into reprodu- reproducing. Yeah. yeah. Also, adding on to what you said about the, um, the VNO That's connecting to the note. hypothalamus, it's so interesting because the hypothalamus is the part of the brain that tries to regulate your body and tries to regulate the balance. So the fact that we kind of need these pheromones for our internal balance kind of speaks to how much we desire love. Right, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, uh, humans are social creatures. It's <laughs> it's how we evolved. It's how we survived to get to this point, you know. So I, it definitely speaks to like that outside external connection with your internal. I have a question. If the if it is scientifically hypothesized that there is a, like a organ in your nose that can that are detecting pheromones. Where are you, are you release, where are you biologically releasing the pheromones from? I mean, the thing is the the pheromone itself is kind of just like the, the chemical signal you get from like the external stimuli. So that could be like, I saw this documentary. It was like, um, I don't know, you guys might have seen this in like some of your science classes, but there was this like short series where this guy wore like this shirt and, um, like he would get like these like people like smell the shirt and without oh. seeing the person they the would person, like they, they would, would try like, to guess whether this person was attractive or not oh yes, oh, yes. I, saw that. I, I saw that i saw it too <laughs> the point i'm trying to make is that you like these pheromones the like from what you're sending out it can be in various things like 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 how you smell or like just we don't yeah. know that yet, but yeah, I also we just know we're releasing them in desperate. Yeah. <laughs> I also have a question. Uh, like, is there a certain radius you have to be like, distanced from a person, to absorb <laughs> or like smell those pheromones? I don't actually know. I think it. De- I think it just depends on what like from what source you're picking it up like again if it's like if it's like a shirt i guess the person doesn't have to be currently wearing the shirt as long as their odor is still on it if that makes sense but i guess if you if we were thinking like naturally like if like say we're walking past each other on the street it would just have to be close enough for where i can like be like interacting with the stimuli <laughs> that you're sending out into the into the world if that yeah. makes sense yeah yeah again it's a it's an evolving field <laughs> i um i remember i read uh i read into a study at some point i think part of a biology homework that said that because pheromones come out of like somewhere like sweat glands or subgaceous glands um that apparently animals which maybe humans also do this too, would brush their hair out their way or flick their hair as a movement when flirting or when trying to mate with other animals to further release the f- desperate pheromones. Ooh. Okay, but how, how does how does So I'm just going to continue guys, flipping like, my hair flick to their one. pit hair? Like, okay. That is no, really no, interesting. No, is that why that guys do really that like weird hair, hair scrub thing? And why girls, you know? Yeah, I mean, your hair is pretty sweaty. 
<laughs> Hair's pretty sweaty. Okay, well, yours might be. Um, it's... <laughs> doesn't apply to everyone. Not off of personal experience, I'm just saying. Your sweat plans are pretty active. <laughs> and everyone's good. <laughs> so... <laughs> Great. I love this. this. These are our main takeaways from this episode. Your pheromones are desperate, and I have smelly hair. <laughs> So if you want a Valentine's Day this year, get really close to them or maybe rub your shirt near <laughs> their nose <laughs> to really activate those pheromones, you know? Want to get a significant other? Maybe send them a sweaty shirt. <laughs> Just, like, ask, ask them to smell your shirt, tips, you, know, you know, and then, and then squirt, squirt oxytocin, oxytocin through, through their nose. nose. Clarinda, we should have a love column. <laughs> we should dating advice for singles this year a squirt of oxytocin in your recently worn shirt should do the trick <laughs> going back to what you said though i think like about monogamy i think it's really interesting how we like posed or not really posed but how we created these like restrictions socially <laughs> to like pick one partner instead of just i guess going with our natural instinct to just reproduce with as many people as we wanted to actually we don't have um our natural instinct is to stick with someone socially our natural instinct is actually to be cheating on someone because we want a relationship. Our brain is wired to give us dopamine and oxytocin when we have a socially bonded mate. But we also would like we are in, we have an inclination to copulation with other people who are technically not your mate. So we but we also don't want our partner to have this inclination for copulation for other people. So we're all just very jealous cheaters. So the social constructs have basically evolved to be like this. And I think the overall conclusion and takeaway from this is I think the first thing we should do is that whatever configuration you choose, polygamy or monogamy, you have to accept that there are going to be trade-offs. There is no technical perfect option without like emotional turmoil. And I think this is basically the choice our biology has left us. In addition, um, in which we may expand on further the next episode. Cultural influ influences work on humans in a way they don't on any other species, and there are environmental factors in the way we grew up that will s almost certainly have a permanent effect on our attitudes. And so what should you do? Because I have just told you that your species has made you a jealous cheater, which is not everything, which is not really what you want to hear. And I think, unfortunately, it looks like the best answer is different for everyone. <laughs> um, meaning, of course, that we have to figure out what's best for ourselves and what path you would like to take romantically and sexually. Like Clorinda said, humans are complicated. Love is complicated. And love is not maybe defined by how we define it traditionally through media and through history as Ali's going to talk about in our next in our next like in our next podcast episode <laughs> <laughs> your inclination to copulation is slowly ruining your mental state and lives <laughs> but the important thing to remember is that but, there's yeah, hope but yeah, the important thing <laughs> Wait, and what? There's hope. You just gotta experiment and see what you're into. <laughs> cool. <laughs> That's such a depressing conclusion. <laughs> but it's not! <laughs> Everything's open-ended. People are complex. Love is complex. And nothing, nothing is ever gonna be as binary as we want it to be in this crazy world. This is where we leave off. All right, thank you guys for tuning in to the first episode and be sure to check out the second episode because it is a follow-up and expanding on the topic of love on Valentine's Day. And um, until then, we will see you. Yeah, you get to learn some interesting history. <laughs>